So, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I have a very exciting uh, program today, inshallah. We have, of course, uh, you all know Imam Isa, mashallah. And uh, Brother Ian uh, has joined our Buffalo community recently, alhamdulillah. And uh, so, he has an interesting history that, I mean, actually, because Imam Isa is the one who's been talking to Ian uh, more. So, I'm going to let Imam Isa kind of like take the lead on this one. Besides my introduction, so Bismillah alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al Mursaleen Muhammadin al Amin amma ba'd. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. So, um, I, I was actually in the masjid with Sheikh Omar last night and uh, I thought I would get to know Ian. Uh, it's not very often I come to most Islamic centers and find another American guy like myself, so I always try to get to know them. But, um, uh, obviously both of us are people who joined the faith of Islam at some point in our life. Um, we weren't born and raised in it. And, uh, it, we, we, from talking to him last night, I realized that actually we have a lot in common. Uh, we were both musicians at one point. Um, uh, we listened to a lot of the same music. Um, I'm, I'm obviously older than him, but, uh, still some of the same artists we were, we were both familiar with. And then we found out that we were both involved in the occult. Um, so uh, not necessarily in the same way, shape, or fashion, but uh, definitely involved in, in uh, the, the dark arts, if you will. Um, now, I think these topics are super important for the kind of born and raised Muslim community to be aware of because... I don't think that the average audience really uh, audience member in a masjid really knows how much of this stuff is going on in society. And they don't know how many people are actually actively involved in doing this stuff. And um, me and Ian are kind of useful to the community in that we've, we've come out of that kind of dark side into the light and we can kind of tell you a little bit about it. But, but for... What I hope comes out of this is that you see that, yes, this stuff is going on. There are actually people who are doing this stuff. And unfortunately, they are from amongst our own people sometimes, which is what I discovered last night. So uh, also, Wicca is the fastest growing religion. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, Wicca is, meaning magic, is the fastest growing religion, which has the name Wicca in America. But, you know, if you go to the bookstore, the, the whole Wicca section, the New Age section, yeah. mm -hmm. is the fastest uh, selling of the books. Well, this is interesting because um, uh, the Theosophical Society, uh, one of their goals was what's called externalization of the hierarchy. So they're occultists, and H Helena Blavatsky, uh, who was one of their big writers, um, she, she the, I mean, the basic theory was that in this late 19th century period coming into the 20th century, we're going to start exposing the world to the occult. Basically, we're going to start making this knowledge wi widely known as opposed to hidden. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively where we are now, you know, s over 100 years later from her time, is the occult is everywhere, and it's in everything. And I was introduced to it through friends who had bought books at bookstores on alchemy and um, at one point had given me a book about it. And they write in their books, like, if you if you get involved in this, we'll eventually find you. You know, it's almost like they know that you're, you're, you're now headed down a path that's headed towards one of these societies, these occult groups, these this magician or whatever that's, you know. Because effectively, you know, without the protection of Tawheed and Wudu and Quran and, and Ghusl and these things, like, who's really influencing you is the, the Shayateen, the unseen world, you know. They're the ones that are going to start inspiring you to go here and there and essentially that happens with thoughts right you don't know if your thoughts are yours or if it's somebody else's you know the, the, the amazing thing about salah is that very quickly on you'll be able to distinguish between your thoughts versus <laughs> external thoughts and so that's like one of the i think the miracles of salah is that you're constantly like oh that's shaitan like push it away right and then you're very clear on okay these are this is me and this is not me and if you don't have salah, if you're not Muslim, then anything can happen. Right. You're not asking 17 times a day, ehdina sirat al mustaqim. So, uh, I want to put a caveat here. So, a lot of times, and this is because of the occult's 
magic spells, and one of them is to dismiss this information and call it uh, with an ad hominem, which is this is conspiracy theories, this is, you know, you guys are just uh, talking about things that, you know, may or may not be true, and we can't prove them, and no, this is from Quran, so if you don't mind, hand me that Mus'haf right there, I just want to quote this ayah for the audience, any Mus'haf will do. Uh, well, an Arabic one would be better. Yeah, that one's fine. So since we're not using Zoom, I have to kind of quote it for you and not show it to you. But right right at the beginning of the Quran, and this is like plain and obvious for anyone who wants to see it, uh, Allah talks about the believers and then talks about the disbelievers and then talks about this group of munafiqun. But then he has something to say about this group of people who seem to think that they're doing good, right? But in reality, they're doing evil. And... Allah says about them, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ Which can be translated as, whenever uh, it's... Uh, whenever these people are, are introduced to the believers, they say to them, you know, we believe also. But then they have this... Uh, khalwa, <laughs> khalwa with shayateen. Okay, this is clear. Unfortunately, I, you know, may Allah preserve uh, some of the good Quran translators. They they sometimes uh, don't really literally translate this word here. For those of you who just read the English, but it says demons. They're alone with demons. So there's a group of people Allah's warning you about at the beginning of the Quran that are appear to be believers. But in fact, when they're alone, they're with demons, and they're they you know they they say that we're just mocking the believers, you know. And for, for them, you know, this is a joke. Uh, but we shouldn't dismiss this. I mean, this is very clear, you know. Warning: the Quran is a warning and good news. So the Muslims and the ulama should be very aware that a lot of this is going on. So. I don't want to spend too much time talking about myself, but how I got involved in the cult eventually was through the entertainment business, through the musicians I was listening to who talk openly about the occult and, and, and their lyrics. And they drop little hints here and there, and then you start Googling through the internet what do these terms mean and what is this? What is he talking about, and you you eventually end up in one of these groups, and you start learning their teachings. And they they always appear very beautiful. Right? It's always done in beautiful language. It's always like this is knowledge, that secret knowledge is going to give you powers and abilities and you're going to be a special person. And It really appeals to your nafs, as we were saying last night. 100%, 100 appeals to your nafs because it makes you feel special. And So when you go down that path, you do start learning interesting facts and phenomena, um, but... At some point, you have to give somebody some money. At some point, you have to do something for somebody. At some point, there's like, you know, more than just you reading and learning involved. You have to start participating. So I used to go to retreats and learn different meditations and things to say. And at some point, I met an actual, you know, sorcerer, an actual magician, a sahir. And of course, he never presents himself that way. I mean, sometimes I imagine they might say that openly, but, but this guy was just a workshop facilitator, you know, and he had a, he had a, a, a sheikh, you know, who, who actually said that he learned this knowledge from a Sufi, okay? Now, at that time, I didn't even know what a Sufi was. So, people who claim to be from us. And one of the things we had to learn was how to contact our higher self. Okay, so sometimes this is called your guardian angel, sometimes this is called many different things, but it's never called anything that you should be afraid of. Your higher self is some aspect of you that if you access it, it will guide you to your purpose. Okay? And you have to start doing things to reach your higher self. So these meditation rituals or whatever. Now, at some point I was asked to talk to my higher self, mm. ask it questions, and then whatever it told me to do, to do what it said. Mm. The first time I ever did this, I knew something was wrong. I asked it a question, and it immediately told me to go and commit zina. Mm. Now, of course, my nafs loved that, okay? 
But I knew that that's not a spiritual thing, mm-hmm. and that's what I was. That's why I got involved and why I got interested. Anyway, long story short, what got me out of that was I discovered a podcast a long time ago, back in 2007, called Wise as Serpents. And these were cri- former occultists who became Christians, mm. and their whole thing was exposing the occult. Mm. And I'll never forget one day they had a lady on their show who, she was a lesbian, or she was a lesbian, and she was also into what's called Reiki. Oh, okay, yeah. And she explained very clearly how all this works. The the Reiki uh, f- facilitator is is a magician. Who's By the way, I have Muslims ask me quite. I, first time I heard this Reiki term, I was like, "What is this Reiki? I don't know." Muslims asking me, "Can we do Reiki? Can we do Reiki?" And then I found out they actually have strings in which they make knots, and then mm-hmm. they blow things into it, and they use their like, left hand to heal you. It's very interesting. Like, but yeah, you're right. It's it's. I mean, I can't say that every single person who does Reiki is bad, but I, I do know this story was very compelling for me. So the woman, she she does Reiki, but how she does it is she's contacting demons. Okay, now she doesn't call them demons at that time in her life, but that's what they are. And this is what she said, and this was so fascinating. She said that we used magic as a business. I ha- had an entity that I would talk to, and the entity would tell me to go to a public place. And I would go to that public place. And it would tell me to walk up to random strangers and ask them if they were experiencing pain in a certain area of their body, and I would point to it. And that person would immediately say, yes, how did you know that? And then I would tell them that I'm a Reiki healer and that if they come to my clinic, I can get rid of their problem. Well, turns out what's actually happening is that these people are people who have no protection. You know that's so interesting. You know heard of the, you heard of the hadith built, uh, in which there's a shaitan called it's it's the hadith of uh, Bakhira, where basically I forget the name of the hadith, but the shaitan puts a disease on people and then has it come to them, meaning to this uh, scholar, and then this scholar would cure them. Bingo. Yeah. Yep. You know, so that's so interesting that that's narration actually that says that. Right. And and that's exactly what she said. Like the person would come to the clinic and the two demons would talk to each other. There was a demon in the person causing the pain. And then her demon would talk to it and tell it to leave temporarily. And she would do her ritual and then the pain would be gone and she'd get paid. And immediately I was like, this you know, and, and of course, they, they're presenting it from the perspective of Christianity and saying how this is, you know, these Bible, Bible verses say this is wrong. And, and it really broke the spell for me immediately. I was like, everything I'm doing is, is demonic and I should not be doing this. And then right around that same time in my life, my older brother became Muslim. Mm. And he started telling me about Islam. And, and, I, and so all of the spells were broken all at the same time right when Islam showed up in my life. So anyway, last night, me and Ian are talking, and Ian tells me about his experiences with the occult. So so how, tell us, Ian, how were you introduced to Speak the loudly, <laughs> sorry for the microphone, because he's soft-spoken, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was introduced um, through through a, a, mi- a mixture of things, uh, through, through, through the music, uh, that I was listening to um, through through things I saw on social media. Parents, are you listening? <laughs> and um, it just uh, it really it, it really piqued my uh, my curiosity and, and like uh, he said it, it a lot of it really it, it speaks to the nafs uh, almost shouts at the nafs and um, I. Because I, I, I had an interest in, in spirituality, um, I, but I, I grew up in a very like Orthodox Catholic household, and I just uh, it, it, it always felt like false to me, and um, I kind of grouped all of the Abrahamic faiths into like one basket as like all the same. Because uh, that's what I had been told that they were all pretty much the same thing, so I, I, I didn't even really bother 
I didn't give, uh, you know, like Judaism, Islam, the time of day, uh, didn't read a, a, any of the texts, had no interest in it. Um, so then I started, you know, I started off, uh, I would read, um, you know, different grimoires. Um, What's grimoires? Grimoire is, I, I believe, a French word. Um, I don't know what the literal translation is, but it's basically like, you could say uh, like a recipe book for magic and different magic oh, spells okay. and how to contact different spirits and things like that. Um, and um, so I, be, I began to do that and I would, uh, began to just read uh, just a hodgepodge of a, a bunch of different uh, books and and was any of this difficult for you to locate, or was it just freely available? And all of it, it was, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, if 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 you have any desire whatsoever to find it, it's not like super hidden. You know, I didn't have to search super hard to find most of these things. Um, and I. Uh, what was I gonna say? Um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the main things for me, though, was uh, I, w I was lucky enough to, at the very least, even in my, my misguidance, always have the, the, the firm belief in that, that, that God was one and that there was one creator, one God. Um, Same was true for me. I always prayed to God. Yeah. Like, I never, I don't, I never recall myself ever becoming like a, a straight atheist. Yeah. Yeah. No, me neither. Um and so um, one, one of the, the big trappings for me um, was, I mean, for example, in Christianity, we, have, we had the, a thing where, you know, anything that good, good that comes to you, you thank God for it. Any, any, uh, anything bad, any trouble or strife, you blame the devil. Um, and I, I, I just didn't feel that was right. I felt like everything comes from God. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. Like there's only one creator, only one source. Um, but in, in that, I, I kind of, I went a little too far with it to the point of, of where I got tricked into believing that, you know, there's, there was no such thing as objective morality and that it was all subjective and that, I, I might think that something is bad just because I don't like the way that it makes me feel or the way that it affects society around me, but in reality it's all a part of creation, so it, it, it doesn't matter to the Creator. The Creator's transcendent, yada yada yada, and... Meaning good and bad are the same. Yeah, meaning that in the eyes of, of God it was all the same. That's what, that's what I believed. Mm -hmm. And a little uh, point here, to is that in the occult... And this is kind of the same thing Dr. Omer points to uh, over and over again. Kind of like the mixing of the, the good and the bad. Right. Um, okay. If you get a little bit further to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, so like a little note here is that in, in the Gnostic occult teaching, uh, evil is something that that is a branch of knowledge that you should seek out mm -hmm. like you should seek out the good and the evil because if you never seek out the evil there's an aspect of yourself that you never access you never complete who you are mm -hmm. same thing that we were mentioning in the video with sister milan that they also teach that god is a is a hermaphrodite a male and a female so if you're a male you should seek out your femininity as a branch of yourself that you will, will complete you right so so it, there's no there's the the the, the 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 Sharia for them is to embrace all knowledge, right? Yeah. Good and evil, explore all aspects of yourself, like especially the things that are uncomfortable. Yes, yes. And uh, there was a, there was a lot of that. I mean, that's that's what I became, you know, hyper fixated on was breaking all all those those taboos and, um, you know, uh, like I would I would go you know, out in the in the middle of the woods by myself in the middle of the night and, you know, like, just, you know, uh, do different, like, rituals and chants and stuff to contact the djinn. Um, I would, <laughs> before I even knew what voodoo was, I would make voodoo with, like, filthy swamp water. Um, 
Uh, now, at what point does the the Muslim sorcerer come into the story? That I'd say it was probably close to a year ago from from now. Um, so a, about a, a year ago. So you had already gotten involved in the reading the books, doing the rituals, yeah, and yeah, then, and then yeah. he showed up in your life. Yeah, how did that yes. happen? So that actually that happened through uh, a, a a mutual a, a couple mutual acquaintances that I had who who had um, one of them who is actually he he the the, the guy I was telling you about that has since left the order and, he, and he's Muslim now and all that. I'm not sure um, good for him. He met this this Sahya at a uh, at a book convention. Um, I don't remember. I don't know what the, I don't remember what the convention was for. But they started talking about the occult, and uh, there was a particular grimoire that uh, this acquaintance of mine had had read and was familiar with, and um, the the Sahir kind of a. Uh, I think saw the, like the, the passion in his eyes for, for that text and kind of took advantage of that by saying like oh that's I've read that book and what what he talks about his craft all that is very similar to, to what I do um, and this guy is you know a supposed Sufi um, you know, talks about the the Sufic current and all that um, yeah. And this is not to bring down any tasawwuf or Sufism uh, because no. he's part of <laughs> yeah. a tariqah. Yeah. Like, yeah. All of us, all yeah. of us are. Yes. Yeah. So um, you know, but there's an orthodox Sufism, yeah. right, which and is within the bounds of Sharia, and then there's the Sufism that has gone into kufr. Yeah, and it's uh, honestly what is it, like one of those things where when you look back on the thing with the knowledge that you have now, it's like how did I? not see all these red flags right from the jump and be right. like, no, you're a liar. Um, but, I mean, like, one of the things, you know, like, obviously in Tasawwuf, we, we, it's the purification of, of the heart, you know. Um, and I believe it was uh, Al-Ghazali wrote about uh, the concept of, you know, like, polishing and cleaning your perceptual mirror, you know, removing the sins from it, all that, so that you can see clearly. Now, did you talk to jinns? Yeah. Did you hear them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, the, or, or when you when you heard them, and I'm just gonna say from my own experience, that they, they, they speak your your voice into your own head. It's not. It doesn't. Like it may have a different character in terms of like the words that are chosen or the intensity in which they're said, but it's like your own voice in your head. It was my experience. Um, at, at times, yes, it would. It would a lot of times be that. Uh, typically, you know, they could very different tone though like a very not in a way i would speak um and i mean i also and there's so many muslim children by the way that in their bedrooms they're doing this stuff right? yeah you know muslim children who the parents think they're praying and they're praying but in the bedroom and when they're alone that's the time where they get connected is when they're all yeah. alone as the quran right yeah. so that, that that's the and this happens to especially Muslim girls who are very young, thinking about suicide, depressed, uh, Muslim boys who think that their parents are just stupid and all cultural and they don't have the truth, and you know, the, and and if they if the and very and it, it's there's a high number of kids doing this in high school. So you might be a friend, your children might be friends with somebody that is doing this, and they introduce your children to this, and. And and then they might fall for that. So you have to be very careful. Yeah. And uh, another another thing I think that especially the the youth really need to be. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up today probably within ten minutes. Yeah. So um, because Imam Isa has a flight to catch. Sure. So we're just giving you a taste today. Maybe we could do a longer session at another time. But I want you to maybe I think Imam Isa wanted you to really focus on the Muslim sorcerer. Yeah. Who's now coming to at that time this non-Muslim to teach him? And this is another way, uh, Imam Isa. I was thinking that probably because you know what I actually didn't realize this until you were saying this right now. I've had so many cases of magic in which I would be you know talking to the shaitan in the person, 
And they'd be like, yeah, we know your Qur'an, and our magician has them. Mm -hmm. Our magician has your Qur'an. Our magician has your Qur'an. I, wallahi, I didn't hear this from one place, like in one case. Over like over years, I've heard this from at least seven, eight different like shayateen saying this to me. Like, what do you think you're going to hurt me? My magician has your Qur'an, right? So it's like they're out there to even give Islam a bad name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they do. They do. They they use Quran, and that was something that was actually emphasized. Um, was the that 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 idea that um, you know that the Quran was you know a, a very powerful text? Except, obviously, they use it in a completely different context from what we use it as Muslims. Um, they usually invert it. Yeah. yeah, no, that that is that was one thing that they, it was literally called the reverse Quran. Um, I never personally saw it or read it, um, but it was something that was spoken about. Um, and then, um, you know, the the, the brother who uh, I had said actually at one point lived in the house with the Sahir. Um, you know, said that he had you know he had Quran there. Um, Except, you know, for one, you know, you would read it and touch it, hold it, all that without wudu. Um, he would write in it. Um, it like, all throughout was just markings, scribblings, you know. Uh, a big, 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 big thing that the sorcerers will do. And you'll actually, you'll, you'll see this even from non-Muslim sorcerers. Um, I, I've seen it in you know, like non-Muslim European uh, magicians and stuff who, who will, any magician who's serious about their craft that learns about Quran, they start using Quran and defiling Quran because that's the number one thing that will get the shayateen to really work with you um, and really do what you want. Um, and so, yeah, he would... Uh, you know, he would uh, all all the letters or whatever. Each ayah had its own weight with the the uh, gematria values of each letter, and so he would, you know, he would rewrite it to insert the name of one of the the the, the of the shayateen that he was trying to traffic with or trying to work with, and in doing that, that would, you know, please the the shayateen or please the shaitan. Um, <coughs> And he would carry out his his uh, his magic in, in that way. By the um, way, was he was he Arab? Was he like yeah? He's Arab. Arab, yeah. yes, Arab. Um, and did he used to go to masjids and be part of the Muslim community? Did he have a family? Did he like um, have kids? Uh, yeah, he did. He did have kids, and that's actually one of the was one of the red flags. Was so he he had he had he had videos that he made and he would upload and. One of them, he was taught. I think it was a video on uh, the story of Cain and Abel. Um, I forget the the Arabic names. Um, Qabil, Habil. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was talking about that, and um, so I mean, we uh, a big emphasis in, in, once I found this uh, that uh, ran into him was the. Emphasis on working with your 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 karin with the, the with the satanic karin, um, so the jinn that's like yeah. with every human. Is that what they called it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they called. Yeah, it? that's what they called it. Um, they would also sometimes refer to it as the the sh reverse shadow double, um, or something along those lines. Interesting. Mm. And uh, in fact, <laughs> another red flag was one of the things that he because he would oftentimes. He, he would say something that just to anybody would just sound off and you just know it's wrong and then he would brush over it and like immediately follow it with something that would be appeasing to your nafs so he would say like some messed up ritual or something and then he'd be like you know what da, 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 and you know power and money and this and that and you're like oh okay i like the sound of that it's like uh, alistair curley in his book he he just kind of passingly mentions that the best way to get the response out of your ritual is to kill a child right yeah, yeah. and, and all, all of his uh you know defenders are like oh you know he was a big jokester and yada 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 and yeah. it's like no he he was serious <laughs> yeah yeah and um 
you know, so like one of the things he said just in, in passing when he was, he was saying, like, yeah, like, when my children were still with me, da 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 and I remember that just stuck out to me, and he actually must have must have slipped out by accident because he ended up deleting the video shortly after it had been uploaded mm. um and i found out several months later um after i had already converted to islam and, and stopped associating with that when the one brother um came out of 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 that um i meant i mentioned that to him as being one of the red flags that had kept me from like fully joining you know that and fully participating um was that you know he had had and this is a, a common thing with people who work with the the shayateen um is it, you know this this whole idea of like this this uh this facade of, of power and of having control over the jinn and yet yeah, but in, in when in reality it's actually the the reverse um you know, you're you're running around in circles. Uh, basically, a, you're, you're you're a slave to the the shayateen instead of a slave to Allah. And, we got uh, we got three minutes, so I want to ask you a question. In this experience of looking for magic and power, what was your most like an experience that you had with the jinns that you were like, oh, this is real. This is like real entities talking to me that know the unseen world like you know it's kind of like did it fascinate you did, did it scare you did you like uh, uh, it was it was very fa fascinating to me um uh like one of the things that i talked about with brother isa last night was the concept of you know i would i would i would write poetry or song lyrics and and, and um and that you know, I, I would basically, I would, I would allow the 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 the, the jinn, I would ch channel what the jinn was was saying, what was telling me to write, like the other songwriters. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would describe different, you know, uh, rituals or different uh, metaphysical concepts or just whatever in in detail about things that I had no knowledge of, you know, that I, I a lot of times I wouldn't even understand what I was writing or why I was writing it, you know, but it, it would just, it was, I would just write like free flow what was coming to my mind. And then, uh, what would you suggest a Muslim parent should tell their children if a Muslim parent suspects their children of doing something like this? What would you say to like a child or a Muslim that says, you know, I don't like Islam, but you know, I find this interesting. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a tough one. That's one that I've, I, I, I think about a, a lot because I, I see it as a, as a growing problem. It's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, I mean, I think that the number one thing that, that, that can really be hammered home is the, the idea that, you know, uh, magic and the things that the, the, the shayateen, I mean, they'll almost, they'll rarely present themselves as shayateen. Um, I would say never. Yeah. Either. I mean, for me, that it actually, what they, with what I got involved in at the end, it was, it was still, they put a, a fancy veneer on it, made it seem not so bad, but they were upfront about the fact that like you know you're working with satanic entities you know oh okay um and but the, 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 the they're going to tell you what you want to hear you know like you're not going to go up to a heroin dealer and they're going to tell you about how bad heroin is and how it can kill you and how it's going to ruin your life and this and that you know they're going to sell you a dream um but Everything so that, that's it. If they're selling you a dream, they're selling you an illusion. Yes, yeah. They're selling you a dream. They're selling you an illusion. Um, At the end, it's just going to be bad for you. Yeah. Even if it feels good in the beginning. And yeah. so, Imam Isa, I'll let you finish off with any last words or any last questions before we have to... Uh... Well, the last thing I'll say is just a brief story of how shortly after I became Muslim, a high school friend showed up in the masjid one day saying that he was Muslim. And I was very shocked to see him there. And a series of events allowed me to actually move in with him. We, we, we started to go every day to the masjid and pray together. 
When I moved in with him, I found that he had all of Aleister Crowley's books on his shelf. And I was like, hey, man, where did all this come from? He's like, oh, this is just when I wasn't Muslim. And we stayed together and was there for like maybe two weeks. Now, two really interesting, thing happened, interesting things happened while I was there. Number one, I got incredibly sick one day after eating with him. And number two, I got in a huge fight with my Muslim brother. And after that two weeks that I stayed with him was over, he came to me and he said, you know, my landlord says you have to leave. You're not on a lease. So I said, no problem. I'll leave. After that, the guy wouldn't answer my calls, wouldn't come to the masjid anymore, and disappeared. Years later, I went back to his Facebook page because my brother, brother had said that he ran into him and the guy said, I left Islam. Mm. And on his Facebook page, what is it? Just a bunch of stuff about Aleister Crowley and the occult. Mm. This guy actually be, pretended to become Muslim, came into the community, got me to come live with him so he could get my hair and stuff, and then he did seher on me to break up my relationship with my brother and cause a whole bunch of other problems in my life. And it took me time to put those two things together. But mm. I'm just telling you, these people, and you don't need to be suspicious of every Muslim you meet, but I'm just telling you how this stuff happens. And so this is a warning. This is uh, stuff that we've actually experienced and been through. And in the Muslim world, this is very popular through, you know, oh, this will bring you closer to Allah. This, you're actually talking to angels. You're actually talking to the saints of Allah. Mm -hmm. like, kind of like, mm -hmm. kinda, like you've got to be extremely careful. Uh, when you're dealing with someone who is trying to be or pretending to be wali on the one side and then like trying to charge you because I'm a wali of Allah and I have yeah. this ability to... Yeah, yeah. Remember the messengers in the Quran, they never ask for any edger. Right. <laughs> they don't want anything from you. They just want you to be guided. Let's, let's wrap up. Soon. Inshallah. Okay, so inshallah we got to go. So thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah we'll have more conversations on this uh, issue. Assalamu alaikum.